Today I'm going to talk about, I'm going to focus more on what happens before the residential care facility because I think a lot of people are unaware that you can receive aged care in the home. I know that sounds, to you, many of you, you'll know that, that there are packages available and there's a thing called HACK that's going to change its, its clothes in a little while and become the home support program. But a lot of people are not aware that they can get help like um, for cleaning, gardening, uh, things like that, as well as nursing care and aged care support. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today because, in fact, only 5% of people in aged care are in residential care. 25% of people who receive aged care live in the community. So that's an enormously huge amount of people. And if I can say one major reason why the government has reformed or turned aged care on its head, it's probably a lot of things. Of course it's cost, um, but we won't go there. I'll let someone else deal with those complicated issues later. But really, um, they, the, the purpose of it is, is to keep people in their homes for as long as possible. So I guess what the Living Longer, Living Better reforms want to do is two things. They want to keep people living in their home and avoid them going into residential care for as long as is humanly possible. And they want to give that person more choice in the kind of care that they receive at home. And those are probably the two things that character, characterise the aged care reforms um, that have taken place. So again, um, I don't know how many of you here receive aged care at home or have or the care of someone who receives aged care at home. He said, can I have a show of hands? Because everyone's quite young and active here. It doesn't look like there'd be a whole lot of people who are actually in residential care. And we've probably got service providers as well. Yeah, hi. Okay. Um, so most of the care is delivered at home. Most of it is, is going to be around this idea of consumer-directed care. Now there's a lot of really, really complex parts of this, but really I think in essence there are three parts. There's the old hack program, which as many of you might know, was until a couple of years ago and it's being transitioned from the state government to the Commonwealth government. So really what's happened is there's been this enormous change where they've taken community care, this one part of aged care, and they've taken it to the Commonwealth because traditionally the Commonwealth Government has been the one that runs residential care. So you've got, you had a system where the Commonwealth Government run, ran residential care and the State Government ran community care. And a lot of people for a long, long time had this ongoing debate, you know, why are they separated? Why in, in, in God's name are they separated? And I think the debate is still on, whether or not we've actually achieved anything. Um, it's interesting to hear Elizabeth saying some of these changes have been very good, but there are teething problems. I think you must admit, Elizabeth, there, there are a lot of teething problems and a lot of people are still confused. So maybe what I'd like to do today is just explain to you those big sweeping changes and tell you what community care really is going to be about. So what they've done is they've taken community care and they've given it to the Commonwealth. And now the Commonwealth is going through this, this huge process of trying to incorporate these two systems into one comprehensive system. And as Elizabeth said, they're they're trying to get a sort of a, a, a what they, they call it my aged care, but it really is a gateway in which everybody will go. So whether or not you want home care or whether or not you want residential care, you have to go through the gateway. And if you want to be assessed for care at home or you want to be assessed for care in a residential care facility, you must go through an ACAT and you must go through that assessment process. So I think that it's really easy to just think about aged care as what happens when you go into a residential care facility. But I think what a lot of people need to, to know is that there is a broad range of services that are available to people in the home and they are designed to keep you in the home as long as possible. And they go from very simple things, from gardening and, and, and cleaning to full nursing care and even clinical care as well. 
So all designed to keep you in the home. Now what they have done is they've created four levels of packages and you must be assessed to be able to be eligible for these packages. They are designed, the, the levels one and two are more basic care and levels three and four are the old um, HD, what they called HD, dementia packages, more complex packages that you can receive. And can I just mention something? I thought I was going to mention this earlier. Um, bef uh, before, a lot of people that we found at COTA are very confused about the difference between a retirement village and a residential care facility. And I know that that's not something that's directly related to this, but I think it's worth mentioning that a residential care facility and a retirement village are not uh, are governed under two completely different pieces of legislation. Retirement villages are basically run through the Department of Fair Trading through New South Wales legislation. They have nothing to do with aged care. And very often, very often what happens is, is that one uh, provider will build an aged care facility but they'll also own a retirement village at the same, on the same campus. And people assume that if they go into the retirement village, they will automatically have entree into the, the aged care facility. And that actually is not the case. It's not something that happens. But uh, very often, a retirement village operator, not all of them, but some of them, will leave the impression that it is the retirement village that is going to be providing them with the care when in actual fact there's no care in a retirement village. You can pay to have the care, but it's not part of what a retirement village is all about. The aged care facility is the one that provides you with that care. Um, oh, and the other thing I thought I'd mention too, Maggie, was um, people living alone in their home receiving uh, community care packages. One of the main things that we've also found really interestingly is that nutrition is a major problem, particularly with people living alone, isolated in their own homes. So again, it's that idea that, you know, it's not just about that 5% of people in residential care that are not getting good nutrition. We should also be confused about those people who are isolated, living at home and not able to get good nutrition because some people are in the first stages of dementia, as you probably know, they've forgotten how to feed themselves or they're so ill, they've come back from hospital, they're not getting good transition care and people stop feeding themselves properly. I have my, my own mother lives on her own and I must say she's not eating the way she used to eat. Because she's older, she just can't be bothered. And it's a real challenge to kind of encourage her to keep cooking. She's always cooked really, really nutritious food for herself, but you know, she just can't be bothered anymore. And I think that's that huge amount of people. And the problem is, is they start doing that in the home when they're not eating properly. That hastens their journey and their, their, it, it hastens their journey into a residential care facility. So I think the nutrition has to, nutrition for people, particularly people living al alone in their homes, is, is crucial. And I think another thing that Council on the Ageing is concerned about is the amount of people living alone in the home and going to be receiving aged care is going to increase greatly over the next 10 to 20 years. There, most of the people, as you can imagine, who are living alone receiving aged care now are, are mainly women, but um, the numbers of both men and women living alone in their homes will increase. There's much more divorce. There's, there's many, many more people who, through the course of their lives, will never marry. So they will be dependent on aged care in the home a lot more than they are now. So I think that just those couple of points I think were worth mentioning. Now the cost. A lot of people have, have been asking, and I'm not going to go into detail about the cost. There are costs associated with home care. So you, you have to pay for it in some way, shape or form. Now pensioners, people who are on a full age pension, will only ever pay a maximum of seven, I think it's 17.5% of the pension for their aged care in their home. They will not pay anything else. It is people who own over, I think it's $24,850 a year, 
who will be charged additional fees for their home care. So it's means tested on your assets and your income. And I think another point that a lot of people have been really frightened about with these aged care reforms is the family home. Is the family home included when people are starting to assess you for care. I just wanted to let everybody know that as of now, now this could change of course, um, and it may, but at the moment when you're assessing care as part of aged care, the family home is not included in your assets and income. And uh, probably the one major point, another really major point about these um, reforms is that when you look at either home care or residential care, it's important to remember that now the Commonwealth Government treats these two things completely separately. So financially they're assessed separately. So for example, well, if it's home care, you're only looking at being assessed for the cost of, of the care. But in a residential care facility, I won't go there today because it's really complex and I probably don't know a whole lot about it, but in a residential care facility you will be assessed for the cost of care separate from the cost of accommodation. These two things are completely separate. You will have a lifetime, you'll have a, a yearly cap on the amount that they can charge you for care and you will have a lifetime cap on what the government can charge you for care. So I'm not entirely sure what that is now. I think it might be $60,000. 60, yeah, 60000 per year. Yeah, yeah, 20000 a year. So another really important thing with these reforms is for people who can't afford it and for people on limited incomes, you will never, ever pay more than $60,000 for your care over your lifetime. So um, that's, that's right, isn't it? At the moment. This is all at the moment. <laughs> I think that's a really important thing to, to, to say because uh, as, you, as you well know, there's a lot of um, dialogue at the moment going around about you know, how are we going to afford all this and I think, I, I think Maggie's point about the fact that the boomers are coming through will really start um, putting a new complexion on, the, on this little conversation. Um, as you know, there was uh, a comment recently by a politician who will re remain nameless, who regarded the pension as intergenerational theft, which gives you a kind of a feeling of the way that policy is moving when it comes to older people. That, you know, I think that Mark Butler, who I, I agree, Elizabeth, he probably was, and, and Maggie, he was the driving force behind these living longer, living better, um, reforms and it was quite brave and he, tr I, you know, as politicians go, he truly believed, and he's a South Australian, yes. isn't he? Yes. Yeah. He really, he really wanted that portfolio. Yeah, he, he did. Yeah. yeah, and I really admired him and we, we did some um, consultations for him when the aged care reforms first came in. Um, I guess the danger is now that the wheels that have started to be turned and the, the sweeping changes that were made two years ago, two and a half years ago, you know, they, they probably will not end up being what they were, what, what they are initially envisaged to be. For example, the gateway that Elizabeth talked about, the gateway through which you will have to go for either home care or residential care. You must go through the gateway and for packages and for residential care you must be um, assessed by an ACAT team. So I think those are really important points. For HACC, I'm not sure, I don't think they've actually decided yet. Now people will go, well, well what's HACC and what's the difference? That's also confusing. There are services that will be like respite, day centres and very, very basic services that will be in what's called the home support program that they haven't really, they're in the process of they're still in the process of working that out. Not sure whether they'll need an ACAT assessment. I believe they're going to have regional assessors. But the idea initially was that the gateway was going to be much bigger. The gateway was going to be not only an, a website and a 1800 number, by the way. I, must, I think I've got it written down. So if you want to write down, um, where did I put the 1800? I thought people might want to know. If I had a PowerPoint, I could write it up on the, on the 
Yeah, sure. I'm just trying to find that 1800 number for you because, um, well, the aged care, my aged care was going to be a gateway and there were going to be regional offices where you could walk in off the street. And this to us is really important because for us, with our constituents right now, not everyone has a computer. And not everybody actually wants to go on the computer. So that's why I think it's really important to, I'll just wrap up by saying, there is the My Aged Care website. That is the gateway for, for right now. There also is a 1800 number. So if you don't have a computer, you can still call My Aged Care. And, and, and just be aware that, that aged care is not about, just about residential care, it's about services in the home. The government is keen to keep people in their home for as long as possible. Somebody's... Oh, great. They've got a brochure. Great. Terrific. You got the 1800 number? 1800-200-422. Thank you. 1800-200-422. That's the 1800 number. Thanks.